Good morning. I'm Sandra Bolte. Glad to be a part of the Sunday service team. There comes a time when we heed a certain call, when the world must come together as one. There are people dying. When it's time to lend a hand to life, the greatest gift of all. We can't go on pretending day by day that someone somewhere will soon make a change. We're all a part of God's great big family, and the truth you know, love is all we need. We are the world, we are the children, we are the ones who make a brighter day. So let's start giving. There's a choice we're making. We're saving our own lives. It's true, we'll make a better day, just you and me. Well, send them your heart so they'll know that someone cares and their lives will be stronger and free as God has shown us by turning stone to bread. And so we all must lend a helping hand. When you're down and out and there seems no hope at all, but if you just believe there's no way we can fall, let's realize that a change can only come when we stand together as one. I think we can have folks stay where they are for this one. We're going to be using our ears a lot. And whether you've been using your ears a long time or you just got a new one, um, it's great to find time to listen to the beauty of music. But before we get to music, what is that music? And I think it has something to do with vibrations. I'm wondering if any of you know what this is. The singing bowl. This is a gift that I got from um, my father-in-law from Nepal. And this is what it sounds like when you hit it. That was pretty cool. Let's see what this one is. This one was actually here when I got here. I don't know its history, but let's listen to this one. A little different. Sandra, will you come over here? You can just hold one in each hand. Just play it. So let's see. Interesting. And here's another one. So there's three different all singing bowls. I'm wondering if you feel resonant with any of these. Raise your hand if you feel some something when you hear this. And how about this one? And what about this one? And possibly a little bit of all of those. Are these, well, they say singing bowls. Are these songs? Thank you. Are these songs that we're hearing here? We're talking about music today. And it's like, I didn't hear any words. Do, word, do music need words? No. Does it need to have more than one note? Or can it be something that is kind of fluttering around one vibration? Was that music, would you say? I think there's something really powerful when we step back and think about something that is so everyday in our lives, like music, and consider its impact in our lives. Those are the things we take for granted. Or we say, I'm not a music person. I'm a book person, I'm a movie person, I'm a sports person, and we just kind of define ourselves in that category, you know? But it doesn't have to be all or Louise. It can, you know, or Louise or nothing. It could be, it could be any number 
of ways that we relate to music. We hear music in the playing of the piano, but we can also hear it on the radio, or we can hear it in the um, on our iPhones or things like that. CDs, what's that? Who said that? Um, and also we can hear it in nature, the sounds of music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. And so today, as we talk about music and the vibrations, uh, we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about it in the sermon, but there's something called limbic resonance. Has anyone ever heard of this idea, this idea that through a connection of resonance, we can feel connected to something that is larger than ourselves? Possibly, um, it is music has sh been shown to be one of those places where great limbic resonance can be found a connection with something larger than yourself, with people in a room, or with people all across the world. So we'll think more about those as we talk about music today. Music has always been important to me. I grew up with my dad playing guitar, uh, and that expanded to dozens of instruments in our home. My uncle's house was full of kids and instruments, always. My mom had a beautiful voice, but she was mostly too timid to sing. I found my niche when I discovered folk music in the 60s. The music was simple, melodic, and the lyrics spoke to my heart and influenced my social consciousness. I bought my favorite guitar in 1968, and it's still my go-to guitar 99% of the time. The music was about civil rights and fairness. I also found the vibration of singing and aligning with other voice to be a spiritual endeavor for me. It lifts me and connects me and makes my life rich. The science of sound is learning how important music is for good health. As organist Elsie Chris said, it's really just about connecting with people, like trying to change their lives. That's all it is. And so it is. Music gave me the courage when I needed it to speak up for myself, to speak up for others, and not just to speak, but to take action. It helped me understand my own feelings and have compassion and empathy for others going through hardship I couldn't even imagine. Through music, I've learned about history, love, struggle, victory, betrayal, and compassion. There is music that goes directly to my heart without going through my head or my filters. It can make me cry or go through a whole litany of feelings I can't even name. There's music that engages my whole body and makes me dance, no matter how I'm feeling when I first hear it. Sometimes I just have to sing, involving my whole physical resonance. Music brings back strong memories and the emotions that go with it. Some make me long for another moment with my mom or my dad. Some make me call an old friend. I love singing and how I feel in my whole body. But the thing I love most is creating harmony. It's not just learning and singing your part. It's that. But it's also listening and being in sync and matching vibrations with another person or persons. It's co-creating. Really, it's a metaphor for how I want to live my life. The reading is an excerpt from a welcome address at Boston Conservatory by Carl Palnack in 2004. One of the most profound musical compositions of all time is the Quartet for the End of Time, written by French composer Olivier Messiaen in 1940. Messiaen was 31 years old when France entered the war against Nazi Germany. He was captured by the Germans in June of 1940, 
sent across Germany in a cattle car and imprisoned in a concentration camp. He was fortunate to find a sympathetic prison guard who gave him paper and a place to compose. There were three other musicians in the camp, a cellist, a violinist, and a clarinetist. And Maison wrote his quartet with these specific players in mind. It was performed in January of 1941 for 4,000 prisoners and guards in the prison camp. Today, it is one of the most famous masterworks in repertoire. Given what we have since learned about life in the concentration camps, why would anyone in his right mind waste time and energy writing or playing music? There was barely enough energy on a good day to find food and water, to avoid a beating, to stay warm, to escape torture. Why would anyone bother with music? And yet, from the camps, we have poetry, we have music, we have visual art. It wasn't just this one fanatic messian. Many, many people created art. Why? Well, in a place where people are only focused on survival, on the bare necessities, the obvious conclusion is that art must be somehow essential for life. The camps were without money, without hope, without commerce, without recreation, without basic respect, but they were not without art. Art is part of survival. Art is part of the human spirit, an unquenchable expression of who we are. Art is one of the ways in which we say, I am alive and my life has meaning. This morning, we conclude our three-part series on the influences of movies, books, and music, and what they have, the impact that they have on our lives. If you missed either of the first two services, in summary, we could say that the characters we see in movies shape our own character in life. The more diverse the stories and characters we see in the movies, the more well-rounded and multiculturally competent our own characters will become. Books unlock our imaginations and it is critical, they are critical, uh, it is critical to read not just books about what was or is through nonfiction, but also what worlds and dreams we want to make real through the genre of speculative fiction among others, especially books from authors who liberate themselves from the societal restrictions of what is possible. Today, our focus zooms outward toward the connection and peace we can sometimes uh, feel when listening to music. Music is such an ex a mysterious form of art and expression. Music can be like the DeLorean from the Back to the Future trilogy, some of my all-time favorite movies, which can take us across time and space like that. Have you experienced that where you can listen to a song perhaps that you haven't heard for years or even decades and in an instant you time travel to another time, either in your own lived experience or to cultures and eras near and far? Music can do this, right? Growing up, I listened mostly to the Golden Oldies radio station uh, in Milwaukee. I'm realizing that the notion of oldies is shifting with likely some of our young ones in the congregation today thinking the oldies are likely not songs from the 50s and 60s, but from the 90s, way back in the last millennia. Regardless, if I hear any of those classics today, I am transported to times driving with my mom or dad, and I feel a love and connection like it was yesterday. Perhaps there are some of these songs that as the saying goes, brings you back, brings you back. Just throw out a few songs, songs that you bring you back. That's my first dance song. Yeah, definitely. Others, let's stay together. Dreams by the Cranberries. Well, 
Teach Your Children Well by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Did I hear Mamba number five? Okay, excellent. Any others? Music is in the ear of the receiver, and it can be a profound reception, a gift we are offered, and one we can give to others in return. This past week, I was thinking about one song in particular that beautifully represents how music can remind us of our interdependence and connection with one another in this long unfurling of human experience. When I was in my first year of graduate school at Chicago Theological Seminary, Hattie studied abroad in Budapest for that fall semester. I had just moved into the Disciples Divinity House, I know, cool name, right? Which is an intentional co-housing community with residents, mostly made up of the university's Chicago Divinity School, but they let a few non-Div school residents in each year. Small world and trivia moment, DDH, as it's known, was the same place that my mother-in-law, Hattie's mom, lived for three years while pursuing her Master of Divinity. During the fall semester, now more than a dozen years ago, while Hattie was enjoying all that Budapest and Europe had to offer a young college student, I found myself in what felt like a building straight out of Hogwarts. My favorite place to study and work was in the library. It was a beautiful, old, ornate room with books too many to count. And I recall often being the only one in this beautiful space, working late into the night. Of course, I missed Hattie, who was halfway around the world that semester. One thing that helped me feel less alone was music, someone to talk to me. Now, we didn't necessarily share common musical interests, Hattie and myself, but, or have like our songs per se. Hattie would often joke that when I would respond to hearing some music with, oh, I love this song, what I really meant was, oh, I know this song. Rather, in my solitude, I just recall that listening to music during that semester helped me feel less distant from her and from the people I love. I remember learning about and listening to one song on repeat over and over again, and it may surprise you. It was the 1985 classic, We Are the World. As one born in the late 1980s, I wasn't familiar with this song until adulthood. But for those of you who were around even very young, this song became an instant global musical uh, phenomenon. Just a show of hands, how many of you have heard this song, We Are the World? Perhaps some of you remember the exact place you were when you first listened to this song as well. Indeed, billions of people around the world may recall this moment in their lives because in, in an internationally coordinated of effort, the song was synced and played across radio stations from LA to France to the Middle East to parts of Africa. A one song, seven minute musical concert was transmitted throughout the world on March 7th, 1985. But it was an achievement that almost never happened. Last month, a documentary just about 10 days ago was released on Netflix that chronicles the process of conceiving, composing, and recording this song. You see all of that, all of that, what happened, all of that which happened, happened just within three weeks. Why? Well, this song, which inspired it, was inspired by a recent song, Do They Know It's Christmas, which came out just a month prior by a group of musicians who came together to raise awareness about ongoing famine in Ethiopia. Harry Belafonte, in experiencing the profound success of this effort, wondered if there was something U.S. Music musicians could do to support what was happening throughout parts of Africa. The new Netflix documentary, The Greatest Night in Pop, chronicles the mad rush to produce what became We Are the World over the next month or so. What proved challenging was the desire to get the best, most popular musicians of the day, not only in the same city, 
but in the same space, the same recording studio at the same time. We're talking like 40 or 50 or more of the most famous musicians at the time. Along with Belafonte, Lionel Richie, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, and Stevie Wonder pulled off a miracle, coordinating a top secret. It, it, the, the movie does a great job getting you intense about it. A top secret gathering after the 1985 American Music Awards held on January 28th, 1985 in LA. I won't recall the whole documentary, but I do encourage you to see it. What unfolded late into the next morning was a group of individuals who were asked to leave their egos at the door, literally a sign on the door that said, leave your egos at the door. And leave your accolades at the door and come together to sing and raise awareness and money to save lives for those dying by the millions in Africa. Diana Ross said at the time, quote, I think every individual in the world wants to contribute and they don't know how. I have a feeling we are creating a shift in what's going on in the world today about helping other people. It's compassionate, it's real, and it's new, end quote. Belafonte shares his laser focus that he had and approach to helping make the world better, offering, quote, I take it one at a time. Whether we can feed one person or we can feed one million, the point is to get in. Well, they clearly got in to the lives of uh, and hearts of people throughout the world. It sold a million copies in the first weekend of the release. It became the fastest selling record in U.S. history. It won record of the year and song of the year at the 1986 Grammys and a special award at the 1986 AMAs. Since the release, We Are the World has raised over $80 million, which is equivalent to about $160 million in 2024 for humanitarian causes in Africa and continues to raise to this day. Quincy Jones, who conducted the USA for Africa Supergroup, said that, quote, We Are the World was something everybody could understand. Even if you didn't speak English, you could understand the melody you could understand the feeling of the song musically, end quote. This point was really profound for me. How could music transcend language and speak to a deeper understanding of the human spirit? How could music, without words, say more than any book could say or movie could display? If a picture is worth a thousand words, how many words could a symphony awaken in our hearts? Quincy Jones says of that time in, in general, quote, music is a strange animal because you can't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't eat it or anything else. And it's just there. Beethoven's fifth just keeps coming back at you for 300 years. And that's very, very powerful spiritual energy. Is music a spiritual energy? But we don't need to go down that rabbit hole of language and meaning to feel the very powerful and resourceful nature of music. Remember the reading that Sandra offered this morning about the musicians who composed and played music surrounded by death and despair during the Holocaust. C Karl Polnack tries to explain this phenomenon, suggesting, quote, in a place where people are only focused on survival, on the bare necessities, the obvious conclusion is that art must be somehow essential for life. The camps here were without money, without hope, without commerce, without recreation, without basic respect. But they were not without art. Art is a part of survival. Art is a part of the human spirit, an unquenchable expression of who we are. Art is one of the ways in which we say, I am alive and my life has meaning. I am alive and my life has meaning. Too often we ascribe and see this life and meaning to everywhere and everyone but ourselves. The resilience of music creates a unity 
through our struggles and our joys, acknowledging that suffering, that the suffering you are experiencing or someone is experiencing halfway around the world is not my own, but I am connected to it. I cannot know your pain fully, but I can sit with you in it and reach out a hand to find a way that we can come out of it. We have been lied to that we are all self-sufficient. No, we need one another, not only through a famine of food, but through a famine of hope. Love is not a sentimental thing. It is a liberating force for good that we can embody through our creation of music, through our telling of stories, and through our building up of character and our laying down of ego. When we sing, there is a choice we're making. We're saving our own lives. We aren't projecting or centering ourselves, taking away the focus from those marginalized. Rather, we are saying that our collective journey is toward collective liberation, that in saving one another, we save ourselves, and that we are all in this together. Indeed, that we are the world. When we choose to sing only in the shower or dance only in the dark of night, we fail to realize the power of music and creation that is within us and around us. When we hold tight to the truth of music and all art for that matter, we can come to appreciate the moments of interdependence and joy of life. In the face of disconnection and despair, we find once again a reason for living. And the reverberations flow through time. 25 years after We Are the World was released, a massive 7.0 magnitude earthquake erupted in Haiti. On January 12th, 2010, the vibrations and death and its aftermath uh, rumbled through the world. Coincidentally, the uh, Quincy Jones and Lionel Richie were preparing to do a re-recording of We Are the World in honor of the 25th anniversary of the original. The earthquake created a clear-as-day orientation for the collective singing. And, again, less than three weeks later, over 80 artists came together to, seek, to sing for Haiti and the world. This powerful video version would be great to watch along with the original on YouTube and the documentary as well, as I said. At the, at the time, I was on the campus of DePaul University and was preparing an interfaith vigil of solidarity with the people of Haiti. I recall clearly a group gathered in, in a circle in the quad and feeling a profound connection with them and for the shared work that is ours to do to bring healing to the world. And yet it would still be 18 months till I became aware of, of now two versions of this powerful musical prayer. My friends, music not only can change the world, it does change the world because you are a part of this world. You are this world and we are here together living upon this world. Because you are a part of this world and, a, and you are this world and we are here together, we must sing a little more loudly we must dance a little more freely, love a lot of more openly, and fight a lot more passionately. If we can, and when we do, I look forward to feeling that connection, a reminder of our oneness from the beginning to now and forevermore. May it be so. And amen. <laughs>